Okay, we'll just wait a couple more minutes, I think, there's still some people arriving. So we'll make sure that everybody's in. Um, Melanie, are you okay to sort of to, to, to keep letting people in if they, if yes. as and when they arrive? Thank That's you. Fine. I'll be the, the door person. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so we can uh, we can make a start then and yeah and people as they arrive uh, will keep on letting them in um but welcome everybody and and thank you so much um for joining us and really pleased to see uh so many faces here uh so many people uh, familiar um and new people and you're, you're all very welcome um so and welcome to what's the second uh, uh event in the uh media and gender groups series of autumn talks um so just a couple of housekeeping points before we um before we begin um so i think everybody has done already but if you could just keep your mic mics mics uh muted just to ensure the um the audio quality um during the um the event um and please note that this this event is being recorded and it's also being um live streamed um, on YouTube. Um, so just so you're aware of that, um, and then you can always go back and watch it again afterwards um, if you would like to. Um, so um, so the Media and Gender Group who, who, host, who are hosting the series of, of talks. Um, so for those who um, aren't familiar with the group, um, um, it's convened by myself and my colleague, Melanie Kennedy, who's also here. Um, and it's a welcoming and um, um, supportive, inclusive um, feminist space. Um, and it feels like it's important to say also it's a trans inclusive uh, feminist space. Um, and it's for people who, who see the um, intellectual and political um, dimensions of their research as, as inextricably uh, connected. Um, and we're based um, in the School of Media Communication and Sociology at the University of Leicester. Um, but we have members and friends and collaborators um, from across the University of Leicester um, and across the UK and more and more um, now internationally. Um, and so we're really pleased to be able to host this, um, these, this series of online um, talks. And it's one of the few good things which has come out of this kind of new moment of, um, of crisis and the shift to going online means that we can um, have speakers and attendees connecting with each with each other who wouldn't ordinarily be able to do so. Um, and so I'm really thrilled to be able to introduce um, our speaker today, um, who's a very significant scholar um, in our field and whose work I know many people here are already very familiar with. Um, but for those um, that, that, that aren't familiar with her work, um, I'll I will, um, introduce her. So um, Dr. Hannah Hamad is a senior lecturer in media and communication at Cardiff University. Um, she's the author of Post-Feminism and Paternity in Contemporary US Film, 
Framing Fatherhood, and that was from 2014, um, as well as the forthcoming Film, Feminism and Rape Culture in the Yorkshire Ripper Years, which is forthcoming in 2022. Um, she's also the co-editor of the 2016 Critical Studies in Television Special Issue on Contemporary Medical Television and Crisis in the, U in the NHS with Julia Hallam. Um, and the 2018 Television and New Media Special Issue on the Cultural Politics of Friends with uh, Shelley Cobb and Neil Ewan. Um, and today she's going to be presenting the talk uh, Nurses in the Media from Call the Midwife to Hashtag Clap for NHS, um, exploring the politics of gender and race in UK media discourse. Um, so Hannah will talk for around about 30 or 40 minutes um, um, and then we'll have some time for, for Q&A um, and for, for some discussion. Um, and for this, we'll use the, um, the chat box function, um, but also you're welcome to, to use the raise hand function and, and share your mic. So uh, both, both are equally fine ways of, um, of asking questions um, to Hannah. Um, but yes, without further ado, I will hand over to Hannah um, and very much looking forward to um, hearing um, her important work. So thank you very much, Hannah, for being here. Thanks so much, uh, Jilly. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, start sharing my slides then. Um, can everyone see? Yes, it's not fully. Yes, now we can see. How about now? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, great. So thanks again, Jilly, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, this is actually my first time giving a talk online, if you can't tell. Uh, so please bear with me if I'm a little bit clumsy with the online uh, platform. Um, if there's anyone here that's heard me speak about this topic before, and I can see that there is, uh, you'll know that this is a research project that I've been trying uh, and arguably failing to get off the ground uh, for a few years now. Um, it's been on the back burner a bit uh, uh, this year, as I'm sure many th things have been for many people, but I do uh, hope to be able to get back to it one day. Um, so the starting point for it came several years ago uh, upon my realisation that the BBC Sunday night drama called The Midwife, which is a serial drama depicting the working lives of a group of NHS community nurses and midwives working out of an East London convent in the post-war decades, had become one of the most watched and highest rated programmes on the BBC. Uh, and that it had done so in 2012, which is the year in which the Health and Social Care Act, one of the most controversial pieces of legislation of recent times, probably until the Brexit bill, was passed, leading to its implementation the following year, which changed the nature of the NHS as we had previously known it, giving rise to an acceleration of the privatization of NHS provision. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the first series broadcast originally in 2012 gave rise to the highest viewing figures for a BBC One drama in 10 years. And in the years thereafter, it went on to garner weekly viewing figures in excess of 10 million with some regularity, while its annual Christmas specials would go on to become the centerpiece of BBC One's Christmas Day programming. Some of the many things that are noteworthy about the extreme success of Call the Midwife include firstly, the fact that it has achieved this success through a form that feminist television historian Vicky Ball refers to as the female ensemble drama, highlighting as she does, that this form has been critically neglected by virtue of the extent to which it is gendered. Secondly, the fact that in its early years, it established itself and its depiction of the nursing profession through an ideal of white middle-class femininity that has shaped representations of nurses in UK media and elsewhere throughout the 20th century and beyond into the 21st. And thirdly, that it rose to major prominence in the landscape of UK television at a time when a culture war over the NHS and its values was being waged on UK TV and at a time when nurses and midwives increasingly came to constitute the public face of that culture war. So this talk is gonna explore some of the discourses of gender and race uh, that feature in the depiction of nurses and care work across a selection of examples from the UK media. Uh, and it's gonna do so by thinking about them in relation to some significant contextual flashpoints in the recent history of the National Health Service 
uh, including, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, the passing of the Health and Social Care Act of 2012. In doing this, uh, I'm going to try to shine a light on some of the more persistent gendered and racialized tropes in media characterizations of nurses, tropes that differently discursively devalue their professional labor, and at a time when the stakes around public understanding of nurses' professional identities have arguably never been higher. So I'm going to start uh, by running through what some of the key flashpoints in the recent history of the NHS have been, uh, thinking especially about those that have taken place in tandem with an upsurge in media discourse about the NHS and depictions of the NHS. Uh, but before I do, uh, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Sarah Benet Weiser's explanation of the term and notion of the flashpoint, uh, especially thinking as she does about the efficacy of that term to understanding recent events and phenomena in popular feminism, uh, and with a view to thinking about the feminist and intersectional potentialities of recent NHS flashpoints as they relate to the gender and racial politics of representing nurses and nursing in the UK media. So Benet Weiser points to a range of different dictionary definitions of the term, beginning with Mary Ann Webster's, which she explains defines a flashpoint as a point at which someone or something bursts suddenly into action or being. She then turns to dictionary.coms, which characterizes a flashpoint as a place, event or time at which violence or hostility flares up, while a more scientific explanation of the term focuses on the flash that is produced by a vapor that is exposed to an open flame, which then briefly ignites, much like the discussion, commentary and debate that ignites in relation to the open flame of a hot button issue circulating in media culture. There is thus much to be taken from these definitions that make clear their relevance to understanding how we view cultural phenomena as flashpoints. But Benet Weiser highlights the pitfalls as well as the potentialities of how discourse circulates in a flashpoint moment, cautioning against ahistorical responses or responses that obfuscate the operation of power. And this is something important to keep in mind while navigating the relationship between text and context as it relates to the relationship between nurses and the media, and as this relationship pertains to flashpoint moments in the recent history of the NHS. As I mentioned, there are a number of things from recent decades that have stood out as media flashpoints in this regard. Principally, the following four things rise to prominence, although they're by no means the only things. Firstly, the failure of care scandal involving the Mid-Staffordshire NHS Trust and especially Stafford Hospital, which took place and unfolded over the course of 2005 to 9, but really emerged as a media flashpoint toward the end of that period. Secondly, the passing and implementation of the aforementioned immensely controversial Health and Social Care Act of 2012, which came into force in 2013, opening up access to NHS patients to private healthcare providers via the abolition of primary care trusts and the introduction of clinical commissioning groups, among other deleterious things. Thirdly, the cultural celebrations and commemorations that took place over the course of 2018, but especially in the mid-summer of that year, to mark the 70th anniversary of the commencement of the National Health Service in July 1948 and also the build-up to these celebrations that had taken place in the media over the previous couple of years. Uh, and fourthly, most recently and crucially, of course, the onset of the COVID-19 crisis and the intense spotlight this has placed on the NHS and its staff and coming as it did at the height of a widely reported Brexit-related crisis in the nursing workforce that had left the UK in the position of having 43,000 vacant nursing posts at the outset of a pandemic that has placed truly unprecedented levels of pressure on the service and its workers. So each of these four major events has been accompanied by an upsurge in cross-media depictions of NHS workers and in media discourse about the NHS, with gender and race coming to the fore, particularly in relation to depictions of nurses and the media discourses circulating about them. Interrogating examples ranging from TV shows like Call the Midwife and Matron Medicine and Me to news media reportage and discourse and social media moments such as NHS 70 and Clap for NHS, 
I'm going to talk you through just some standout examples of media depictions and discourses of nurses that have been responsive to some of these flashpoints, although I won't have time uh, to cover them all today, unfortunately. Um, so in this way, I'm going to chart some aspects of how the relationship between text and context as it pertains to the relationship between depictions of nurses and these key contextual flashpoints can be understood. Before I start doing this, though, I'm going to briefly look back at some of the commonalities there are in the findings from some of the foundational work that's been done by scholars and others on the cultural politics of gender and race in media depictions of nurses over time. An important publication in this regard is one that was written by a nurse and intended also for a reading audience predominantly of nurses, published as it was in a book series called Nursing Today which was intended to address and meet the needs of nurses then working in the profession. And that's The Politics of Nursing by Jane Salvage, which was published in 1985. Significantly though, the work that Salvage did in this book on media imagery of nurses in particular, uh, proved itself accessible and interesting to a general readership of women, and also uh, of concern from a feminist point of view, when material mostly taken from the chapter Images and Reality that deals in the main with media depictions was published as an extract in the form of an article entitled Nursing Behind the Painted Smile in the April 1985 edition of the feminist monthly magazine Spare Rib. Pointing to cross media representations of nurses, one key thing that Salvage remarks upon is the consistency of these images when taken together and from one example to the next, making the important point that they focus not on what the nurse does so much, but more on the way she is supposed to look, specifically female, uniformed, young and white. And she, like others, is also concerned with identifying tropes and types that emerge across representations, as well as in highlighting instances where the media plays a part in negotiating some of the gendered power dynamics of the healthcare professions through its representations of nurses. So, for example, she talks about the prevalence of heteroromantic relationships between male doctors and female nurses in romance novels. She talks about the fact that across every example from the media that she worked with for the chapter, the nurses depicted were all women, despite 10% of the nursing workforce at her time of writing being men. And she talks about the highly gendered range of types that emerge and uh, about which I'll say a bit more on the next slide. Um, in doing so, she also cites the cognate work of Philip and Beatrice Kalish, whose 1987 book, The Changing Image of the Nurse, represented the outcome of a qualitative content analysis that they had undertaken to track the changing image of nurses and nursing in books, films, television shows, and magazines from the late 19th century through to the mid 1980s time of writing. As the outcome of this research study, Kalish and Kalish identified five dominant images of nurses in the mass media, each of which they argue has experienced different levels of prominence at different points in history due to changing contexts and gender roles, both within the profession and without. For example, they argue that the figure of the sexy nurse, whose uniform circulates in the media less as a marker of professional status and identity than as a fetish object, became a trope in the post-war decades as a result of shifting gender roles that accompanied the various women's movements that rose to prominence during that period, which in turn, they argue, impacted upon cultural imaginings of nurses. And in this way, their understandings of how and why media imagery of nurses changes over time sits well alongside the work of cultural studies scholar Julia Hallam, who in her own cross-media study of post-war images of nursing, argues that there are intermittent spikes in our cultural appetite for media imagery of nurses, responsive to changing contextual factors like feminism. So as Hallam argues in her 2000 book, Nursing the Image, Media, Culture and Professional Identity, there are particular moments when there is a groundswell of dense public activity featuring nurses across various texts and in a range of media forms. And she situates these groundswells of media representation alongside contemporaneous developments like the formation of the NHS in the 1940s and the rise of second wave feminism in the 1970s. 
to all of these historical examples, I would of course also add the four aforementioned flashpoints from recent history, uh, uh, the recent history of the NHS that I mentioned earlier. But bef before I delve into any of those any deeper, I'm just gonna say a little bit more about the findings of all of these studies. Uh, firstly, the one thing all three of them have in common is their agreement on the main ways in which nurses have been typed in the media and the dominant kinds of gendered stereotypes that emerge across multiple examples over time. So all three of these studies using only slightly different terminology from one to the next, uh, all three point to imagery that differently paints nurses as angels, battle axes and sex objects in different contexts and to different degrees. The angel stereotype, as all three have pointed out, can of course be traced back to the roots of nursing in religious orders. Uh, and this is of course where the epithet sister comes from. Um, but in more modern contexts, it has a tendency to connote and continue to negotiate the idea that nursing is a vocation rather than a profession and that personal qualities, the right disposition and a calling are what makes a nurse rather than the quality of their professional practice. And from there, it's not hard to see how these kinds of assumptions enabled by these kinds of representations have the potential to be politically mobilized to, for example, keep nurses doing high stakes work on low pay, a problem that continues into the present as I'll return to later thinking about nursing and the media in the context of coronavirus. Okay, so the other two uh, of the three major stereotypes of nurses that emerged from all three research studies, battle axe and sex object, tended to view nurses dichotomously as either desexualized authoritarian harridans, uh, Nurse Ratched from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was pointed to by more than one of them as the iconic example, uh, or as hypersexualized objects of male desire. Uh, and in the UK context, the roles played repeatedly by Hattie Jakes and Barbara Windsor in the Carry On films of post-war British cinema, like 1967's Carry On Doctor, as illustrated on the slide here, are the iconic examples of these misogynist stereotypes getting perpetuated and normalized. It was only in 1975, at the height of second wave feminism with Angels, that the first UK television series to focus specifically and exclusively on the working lives of nurses appeared. Angels ran for nine years, depicting the lives of a group of ingenue nursing students. Viewed today, it's striking for the extent to which early episodes were relatively disinterested in the romantic lives of the characters, preferring instead to focus on the relationships between nurses. Uh, and this is something we see later in the early years in particular of Call the Midwife. Doctors are almost nowhere to be seen. And when they are, uh, uh, it's often to dangle the prospect of a romantic narrative thread only to take it away. So for example, in one of the early episodes, one student nurse, Ruth, who has been flirting with a young doctor, a male doctor, calls the flirtation to an abrupt end after a stint working on the hospital's maternity unit, opens her eyes to the realities of pregnancy, childbirth and childcare. Staying with angels for a minute, uh, something else I want to pick up on from both Salvage and Hallam is this idea that as Hallam writes, the stereotypes of nursing in media and popular culture have remained within a discourse of white femininity, underscored by the adherence that you can see here in this publicity still of what Hallam, referencing a real world publicity and recruitment drive for nursing from 1972, calls the take four girls approach to media configurations of the cultural identity of the ideal nurse as normatively young, white and middle class, and which is thus articulated through a politically disingenuous multiplicity of subjectivities, all young, white, well-spoken, and usually middle or upper middle class. And as you can see here, we see the same thing again in the early years of Call the Midwife 30 years later. A problem with the normalized recurrence of the take four girls approach uh, is that it of course glosses over the extent to which the viability of the NHS in the post-war period was secured by the presence of immigrant nurses of color from places like Malaysia, the West Indies, the Philippines uh, 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 and elsewhere in its workforce, whose labor was required to prop up the service during a staffing crisis at that time. Uh, and it has been ever since. 
Uh, and it's only relatively recently in the context of media flashpoints in the recent history of the NHS, like the 70th anniversary in 2018, the mainstream media discourse has started to do more to recognize the realities of that history and to include representations of these nurses in mediated depictions accordingly. For example, uh, originally broadcast as part of the BBC's Black and British season in 2016, Black Nurses, the Women Who Saved the NHS, was shown again two years later as part of its NHS at 70 season. So despite the ideal of whiteness proffered through the take four girls and other approach and other discursive means, the historical reality is that contributions made to the delivery of NHS care by nurses in the formative post-war decades of the fledgling service by immigrant women's labor are well documented, including by writers we've already encountered like Jane Salvage and Julia Hallam, uh, and not least by the BBC, uh, which made an important intervention with the production and broadcast of this one-off documentary. It shines considerable light, not only on the importance of the role of these nurses in staffing the NHS at this time, but also on the extreme and overt racism they experienced by patients and colleagues on the one hand, and the structural inequalities they experienced within the nursing profession on the other, which funneled black nurses into training programs that resulted in the inferior state enrolled nurse qualification, preventing their professional status from being internationally recognized outside of the UK, and meaning that pathways to promotion to higher ranks like sister were not open to them. Acknowledgement of the reality of this history also shines a light on the initial representational absence of these women in nostalgic media fictions like Call the Midwife. For six series and a clutch of Christmas specials, Nonata's House, the East London convent that houses the nurse midwives that make up the show's principal cast, had been home to an interchangeable parade of white and largely middle-class young women, up until the introductions of some more noticeably uh, uh, working class or underprivileged nurses. First in the 2015 fourth series with the introduction of nurse Phyllis Crane, played by Linda Bassett, who grew up as the illegitimate, illegitimate child of a poverty stricken single mother. And later in the 2017 sixth series of former army nurse Valerie Dyer, uh, played in the show by Jennifer Kirby, uh, who was a popular local recruited to the Nanatus House team by Jenny Agata's sister Julienne from behind the bar of an East End pub. Uh, but then for the 2018 seventh series broadcast in the year of NHS at 70, nurse Lucille Anderson, an immigrant nurse from the West Indies played in a series by British actor Leonie Elliott was written into the series to intervene in the ubiquity of the whiteness that had previously characterized the transient population of Nonata's house. As part of an address to the Radio Times and BFI television festival in June of 2017, Call the Midwife creator Heidi Thomas made clear the extent to which the introduction of Nurse Anderson as the show's first nurse of color to feature as a recurring character was a conscious decision and a deliberate intervention into Call the Midwife's status quo in which whiteness is a universal subject position for the regular cast of nurse midwife characters. Furthermore, she attributed this to the new research she had undertaken into historical realities of the NHS during the depicted period, which, Thomas said, has made me very aware of the contributions made by West Indian and Caribbean nurses to the NHS in the early 1960s. Um, staying with this aspect of NHS history in the media uh, for the next example, I'm going to go a bit further back to the earlier build up to the 70th anniversary commemorations, which began in earnest on the BBC two years earlier in 2016, uh, ostensibly to mark the 70th anniversary of the passing of the National Health Service Act of 1946, albeit as we know, um, it didn't come into effect uh, until the service commenced in 1948. Uh, and this preliminary commemoration of NHS at 70 began with the production and broadcast of the first series of the daytime documentary show uh, Matron, Medicine and Me, 70 Years of the NHS. 
It ran daily for one week in July at 9.15 a.m. in the immediate post-breakfast slot, indicative of a likely target audience of retired people, among others. The premise of the series is that it takes and harnesses the celebrity status and appeal of five reasonably well-known figures from various spheres of popular media in order to shed light on various services that are provided to the people of Britain by the NHS in what was mostly an uncritical celebration that seemed at noteworthy discursive odds uh, with the treatment of the NHS elsewhere in the mainstream media, particularly and most problematically, uh, as Oliver Hewitson research has demonstrated uh, in relation to the years leading up to this moment uh, in the news and current affairs media. Episodes of Matron, Medicine and Me uh, are framed as autobiographical tales that personalise each celebrity's respective experience of a range of NHS services and resources, enabling easy identification by the viewing audience with the scenarios depicted and the messages of celebration, appreciation and gratitude proffered. Uh, and my specific focus uh, is on the second episode that you see illustrated in the slide here, in which we're invited to view the history and practice of NHS nursing through the eyes of pop star and presenter Mylene Klass. Uh, and the reason for this is, of course, the focus of this episode on NHS nursing's reliance in the post-war decades on the immigrant labour of women of colour. Uh, so I'm going to attempt to show you a clip now by stopping this screen share and starting another one. So bear with me a second. Um, here it is. I'm Marlene Class, and there's one area of NHS care that means a lot to me. Nursing. <laughs> I need a doctor! I'm I'm I need a nurse. nurse! It means a lot to me personally because of one very special person, my mum. She came here as a nurse 41 years ago. You have so much courage. I'm so proud of you. I love you, Marlene. Oh. I want to find out her story and the story of the millions of other nurses who have made the NHS what it is today. I'm starting my journey on the 1036 service to Great Yarmouth. But I'm not travelling alone. Joining me is my mum, who worked as a nurse in the NHS for eight years. Oh, look at you. Look at the shoes. Yeah, well, that's not exactly uh, the, the uniform shoes, but <laughs> I, I, tell. I, yeah, I just finished my shift and then we're just about to go to a party. And that uniform, was it, was it nice to wear? I like the uniform, uh, but the shoes, I did like it. Uh, the shoes that we wear, I did like it one bit. Was it April? Do you try the Great Yarmouth? Yeah. At 11, at 12. We're actually going to the uh, hospital where my mum first came to uh, in Great Yarmouth, where she was training as a nurse. When you first came from the Philippines, right? Yeah. You think you'll remember what it all looked like? No, I don't. I don't. I was sort of expecting lots of changes, I think. I mean, you're talking about many years ago. Final station is Great Yarmouth. Hello. It's always special coming back to Great Yarmouth. This is where my mum settled when she arrived from the Philippines. And it's where she fell in love with my dad. We lived here as a family and I went to school here. But the truth is, I really don't know a lot about my mum's life as a nurse. So today is my chance to fill in the blanks. Mum worked in the town's Northgate Hospital. Back in the 70s, it was a busy local hospital. Today, it looks quite a bit different. She hasn't been back here for over 30 years, so I'm not sure how she'll be feeling. Oh, let's go for that. Wow, lots of change. This is new. This is new. This yeah. looks new. Amazing. What about the smell? This... Does that smell the same? Like love, the love the smell. <laughs> better smell, actually. A better <laughs> smell. <laughs> oh, God. I feel strange. I really do. Are you getting upset? Nice. Ah, come here. I 
I didn't think that I would feel it this way. 41 years ago. You set me off now. Oh my gosh. It's clear that just being here is making the memories flood back for Mum. Oh, this is the one. I remember this. Remember the, oh my the rail? God. Yeah. But her experience isn't unique. That's right. Now get the head well back and seal off the nose. That's right. Put your mouth right the way round her mouth. With a new dressing, perhaps you'll sleep for a little while. Thanks, nurse. In its early days, like now, the NHS was understaffed and struggling to cope with demand. Nurse! Nurse! nurse. Come nurse. quickly, please! Nurse. My children need you. Nurse! In response, the service looked to recruit people from all over the world. Many of the nurses working in our hospitals today come from overseas, and with the shortage of hospital staff as it is, it would be very difficult to run our hospitals without them. And thousands came from the Philippines, including my mum. It can't have been easy as an ethnic minority, especially in very different times. I know what it was like for me as, like, second generation or being a mixed-race kid growing up in Norfolk, but mm. for you as a first generation... Yeah. Well, you can feel it. You can feel it inside you that they're a bit reluctant at first, but then I am there to do a job, so I have to approach them first. I have to inject myself to them and, uh, you know, well, if they accept me, fine. If they don't accept me, I will still insist that they, you know, I have to do something. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm going to, to help something. you. Yeah, I'll have to do something for them to gain their uh, trust that I am their friend to start with. I like they didn't know if you spoke English. Yeah, well, they thought that, you know, we, I can't speak English until you open your mouth and say, <laughs> hello, everybody. You, you used to be an English teacher, so you probably speak... <laughs> yeah, but they don't, know, English. they don't know that, do they? OK, so I'm just going to uh, stop the share again, folks, and do the same thing, go back to my slides. Bear with. OK, um, uh, so uh, in light of uh, things like this taking place alongside what was about to happen uh, in uh, Call the Midwife and with the production uh, of the Black Nurses documentary in the same year, uh, it started to seem like there was a little uh, wave of um, revisionist historicizing uh, about the way the nursing profession had been staffed in the NHS coming through uh, from the BBC uh, at this time in the build up. Uh, to uh, NHS um, uh, at 70. Um, um, but before all this revisionist historicizing started to come through in representations um, uh, like these, uh, uh, representations of uh, nurses of color on British TV were a bit more problematic. But um, uh, before I uh, move on from this example, it is also really important to note that later on in the episode, it, um, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, folks. It's bear, bear with me. The uh, slideshow has uh, frozen. I'm going to try that again. Okay, we seem to be back in business. Yeah, also really important to note that later on in uh, that uh, episode, uh, it features Jilly's great auntie, uh, who was a matron in a hospital in Belfast, and her name was Betty Boyce. And uh, I couldn't really let that slide uh, without telling you about it before I move on from this example. But like I said, before all of this revisionist historicizing started to come through in representations uh, like the one that we see here, and like the other two examples that I talked about, Mainstream media depictions of black and brown nurses evinced an unfortunate tendency to adhere to some problematic and damaging racial tropes that all too easily aligned with assumptions about women of color that are depressingly recognizable from colonial discourse and often to do with, off with what is offered up as an excess of sexuality. Uh, so here, for example, in relation to the mid 90s medical drama Staying Alive, uh, which was on ITV across 1996 and 1997, uh, uh, that followed the lives of student nurses in a London hospital. Uh, Julia Hallam has argued uh, that difference from nursing's feminine ideal is articulated here as racial otherness through the character Kelly played by Sophie Okinado, who she suggests is depicted as dangerously sexualized as a kind of temptress 
who disturbed the dynamic of the friendship group by an illicit affair with one of the other characters. Uh, bringing things forward to 2020 and thinking about nurses in the media during the coronavirus pandemic, since the onset of the COVID-19 crisis here in the UK, there's been more commentary and debate about NHS workers flying around the online mediascape than it has been possible to keep up with. But there are some issues that rose to particular prominence over the weeks during which the crisis intensified in March and April, some of the most noteworthy of which include the Tory hypocrisy of clap for NHS, the entrenched devaluation of nurses that this crisis has shone a new light on and hopefully intervened in, uh, and the NHS workforce's dependence on the people who live and work under a government whose party and leader has been openly hostile toward them. So news media footage of Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Chancellor Rishi Sunak standing either side of the door uh, uh, of 10 Downing Street clapping for NHS workers on the 26th of March quickly became an iconic image of Britain in the time of COVID-19. But for many, the sound of their claps rang hollow, while the sounds of their cheers after they voted down a motion to increase nurses' pay in 2017 still resonated. For writers like Jane Salvage, quoted on the slide here, the discrepancy between the high stakes work done by nurses and their low pay has always been attributable for them to the fact that nursing continues to be viewed by many as women's work and increasingly as women's work performed by immigrant people of colour. As I mentioned earlier, just as the COVID-19 crisis was really taking hold in the UK, the mainstream media was reporting on the staffing crisis in the NHS, which had been exacerbated by the exodus from the service of EU citizen NHS workers who left this country in their thousands in the years since the referendum. This produced a crisis in the workforce that, as I mentioned at the start, left the UK in the position of having 43,000 vacant nursing posts at the outset of a global pandemic that placed truly unprecedented levels of pressure on the service and its workers. And long before the COVID-19 crisis had even emerged, the NHS was already under more pressure than it ever had been, not just because of the recent departure from the service of these EU workers, but thanks to a decade of austerity cuts and the negative impact of the implementation of the 2012 Health and Social Care Act, which fundamentally changed the nature of the service as we had previously known it. On the 2nd of April, Louise Condon, Professor of Nursing at Swansea University, wrote an impassioned letter to The Guardian about the way in which the nation's nurses were being spoken about and depicted in the media. As she argued, in news reportage about frontline NHS workers treating and caring for the infected, the work of nurses was frequently being devalued, disrespected and deprofessionalized. This phenomenon, although it is far from new, seemed all the more egregious in the context of the COVID-19 crisis, when nurses and other healthcare workers were and continue to uh, uh, risking and in some cases losing their lives. Many people saw footage of flummoxed Health Secretary Matt Hancock on BBC Question Time on the 2nd of April this year, admitting to Dame Donna Kinnear of the Royal College of Nursing that he didn't know that nurses dying of COVID-19 were at that time not even being counted, when he acknowledged that four doctors had at that point died so far, but was unable to say how many nurses. In Condon's view, Representation and perception are an integral part of the undervaluing of nurses. And in posing the question, when will the media wake up to the fact that nurses are not angels, but highly competent clinicians? She gets right to the heart of the issue of the media and popular cultural representation of nurses that has plagued public understanding of their professional status and clinical skills for decades. 35 years earlier, nurse and writer Jane Salvage was already highlighting that in viewing the nurse as a selfless ministering angel, it was easy to lose sight of them as a skilled worker doing a difficult and complex job. In the same article, Salvage also drew attention to the extent to which the NHS has been dependent on the labour of immigrant nurses of colour throughout its history. And as the coronavirus crisis has shown us, that remains the case today. Uh, thanks so much uh, for listening, everyone. I'm just going to close um, uh, my presentation uh, by acknowledging my mum, 
who is obviously the inspiration for my academic interest uh, in this topic. And uh, 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 here she is at the beginning and end of her nursing career on the day she won a prize for being the best nurse in her cohort and on the day that she uh, retired. Uh, that's all from me. Thanks for being here, everyone. Oh, um, thank you so much, um, Hannah. That was absolutely wonderful. And I could have just listened to you um, talking um, about this topic for so much longer. Um, so um, I'm sure people have um, lots and lots of questions. And so please feel free to um, um, to post them in the in the chat box or to um, or to raise your hand um, and you can share your mics uh, so however you want to do it um, but um, while we're waiting for that maybe I can uh, maybe I can exploit my position um, as as host and well first of all yes just want to say again how incredible and powerful and uh, thought-provoking that was and Thank you for including both my Auntie Betty and then also the, uh, it was so wonderful to see uh, the sort of inspiration for your um, for your interest in this topic uh, um, by by sort of uh, recognizing your mum's work as a nurse. That was so, so brilliant. Um, so I've got lots and lots of questions, really. Um, but I guess what, one thing which which you said, which really sort of seemed to get to the heart of so many of the problems that you're outlining is the kind of question of when will when will the media wake up um and and i guess i was thinking throughout your, your talk about how this kind of um you know these moments and these flashpoints of visibility for for um of of nurses and nursing um doesn't seem to convert into any kind of uh meaningful valuation of nurses work and I just wondered if, what, what, what you think about that, uh, uh, if you can say something about that, about this sort of, sometimes it's sort of real mismatch between what seems to be a real appreciation of nurses and their work, um, but why that is, why that never ever seems to convert to material change and valuation of, of nurses. Mm. In, um, so if you, yes, I'd be really interested to know what you think about that. Yeah, well, I mean, um hopelessly naively like uh even even i thought for a second that clap for nhs was like going going to translate into a real revaluation um of uh, 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 uh of the value of nurses to uh this uh country but of course i i should have known better than to think that anything uh, would actually happen and then and then quite the opposite uh happened uh when the the uh chance presented um and like like the writers who have been writing about this topic for decades have been very clear and candid in their opinion that the reason that um uh the adulation of nurses never translates into meaningful pay rises is is that it is still viewed as women's work well, that is work uh, performed by members of society who are themselves devalued relative to other members of society. And they've been equally candid that they think that the media archetypes of nurses as ministering angels has, um, has helped to negotiate that idea that, you know, and may maybe some academics can recognize this too, that, that the work you do is a vocation and a calling rather than a job of work and that therefore the work is its own reward. Um, and so when those two sets of things intermingle, like a kind of vicious cycle in, ensues. And interestingly, reading about the history of um, nurses' pay struggles was really interesting as well, just to see the extent to which um, like once every few years, there seems to be a, a, a kind of um, acknowledgement uh, with a big payoff that brings nurses in line with equivalent public sector workers. But after a few years, nurses always slip back while other public sectors slip forward. Yeah, but I mean, that's definitely like an issue that I really want to find out more about and think more about is the relationship between the media's negotiation uh, of discourse about nurses and of those archetypal images uh, and what's 
taking place in the ongoing struggles for adequate remuneration yeah absolutely yes thank you um i have i have i have more questions but i can see that um that we've got some sort of well first of all lots of love in the chat box um i think you know so much appreciation for your talk and um i can see that ganiat um who's joining us from nigeria um is saying well first of all how happy she is to have attended the session and that she's writing an article on the framing of nurses in soap operas in nigeria oh fantastic yeah, so maybe maybe you can tell us some more about that, um, Ganiak, because that sounds really, uh, really fascinating. And yes, it'd be wonderful to hear more about that. Um, uh, lots more, uh, lots more love. Um, and um, and Charlie has said um, uh, this isn't really a question, but have you seen the current exhibition at Wolverhampton Art Gallery called Here to Stay, which focuses on the Windrush generation NHS nurses stories of careers? Uh, so it's not media as you research it, but, but what might you think about this kind of representation? Yeah, no, I would love to see that. Um, uh, regrettably, uh, I have not left Cardiff for some time and I do not anticipate that I will leave Cardiff for some time. But I would love to see uh, uh, that uh, exhibition. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's, it's true. It's, it's not the kind of media that I normally research, but I am, I am really interested in everything about this topic from a cross media perspective. So I would absolutely want to see uh, uh, an exhibition, especially uh, about the Windrush generation, uh, and especially considering how uh, the issues that have affected um, the Windrush generation as a result of the actions of this government and the recent government have intersected uh, uh, with the fact that um, so many of them spent their whole working lives in the NHS. So yeah, I would, uh, I would definitely want to find out more about that. And maybe one day I'll get to go to the exhibition. <laughs> to go to Wolverhampton again one day but yeah it's um I mean Charlie if you if you if you wanted to say some more about that if you've been to that exhibition then that would be that would be great to hear more about it um as well and um um so uh uh I think is it Diane Charlesworth has uh, has, has said uh thank you as ever it was really interesting um in your in your analysis of the socio historical context and the more recent television representations, do you get a sense that what was produced or commissioned by the BBC changed in tenor and critical focus as it uh, uh, as a as it too as a public service institution was being placed under pressure? Yeah, I really do get that sense. I mean, I haven't done industrial research to the extent that I have any grounds for saying that, but I think that Diane's critical instinct there, if that's what it is, is bang on. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I, I, I do get that sense. Um, all, all the more so in uh, light of some of the programming decisions they've taken in the aftermath of Black Lives Matter and in the aftermath of the Windrush scandal as well. Um, Hi, Diane. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, Miriam um, says that uh, she was going to say this reminded that I took the government's retraining career test and it told me to be a paramedic or join the military. Lol. <laughs> and uh, from what I've heard, it's been giving people paramedic as an answer a lot. I understand paramedics are highly in demand, but I've also a weird feeling paramedics have been in the media a lot recently. Hmm. Um, any thoughts or comments? And sure. Yeah. Shout out to your mum as well. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I haven't, I haven't done any any quantitative research or anything like that. But I, I have been just anecdotally noticing uh, the documentary series, Ambulance. Is that its name? Ambulance, and um, uh, and others of that ilk. So it almost seems like yeah, paramedic TV is sort of emerging as a subgenre of medical TV, especially in factual. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a very valid observation and not something I had thought about at all. So thanks, Miriam. Yeah, that, and that's very interesting that, that I've not taken that test, but um, it's, I haven't taken it either. I've been seeing everyone else's uh, uh, posts and yeah, but interesting that so many people are coming back as paramedic. I can't help but think it's because academics are, are people people. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, and I wanted just to come back to to Ganiat's point about how she's researching uh, representations of nurses in the, in the Nigerian context. I guess it, um, I'd be really interested to know what you think is sort of um, 
I mean, what you've done so brilliantly is show how the, the, the context is so important for the, for the text. Um, and I wonder, you know, how, how the sort of particular history of the NHS and the particular sort of socialised model of healthcare, uh, which it was founded on, um, you know, how, it, how representations of nurses are different in different contexts that have different kind of models of funding models and, and non or non socialized models of healthcare. So uh, do you have a sense of the sort of differences between British and US television, for example, in their or media more broadly? Only in so far as other people have written about it, as I have to be honest, I haven't done very much research about American television, uh, but Tanya Horek has done a brilliant comparative analysis of the US and UK versions of One Born Every Minute and like everything that is fascinating about the differences between the two versions of One Born Every Minute are attributable to the, the um, uh, different contexts of medical care in which childbirth respectively takes place in those countries. So one thing that was mind blowing to me is that One Born Every Minute in the US was like not really quite the cultural phenomenon that it was here. I don't know if you can remember back to the, like the first few years of when One Born Every Minute was on was consistently the highest rated show on Channel 4. And um, it was just like, uh, uh, in as much as a documentary television show uh, can be, it was kind of a cultural phenomenon. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that phenomenon in the US that it was here. And uh, Tanya's theory was because that it was just inherently without drama because in the American system, everyone has an e epidural. So, the like <laughs> the formula that was built oh, Sarah de Benedictus has also done brilliant work on one born every minute which I uh, insist on giving a shout out to while I'm here but um uh where was it going with that yeah and so like the dramatic formula that was built into the UK version uh, of one born every minute which was itself in some respects born of the healthcare context of this country was just not present in the uh, US version and I guess they weren't able to adapt in a way that created drama from other kinds of narratives. Um, but yeah, that's the only example I've got for you, Julie. That's so interesting. Thank you. Um, Julie, I, I'm just going to, oh, sorry, I just want to jump in because yeah. I can see that Shelley's, Shelley's got her hand up and um, we've got more comments coming in, but I know that Shelley's got her hand up as well. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I didn't spot that. So thank you, Melanie. Yeah, um, are you there, Shelley? I am. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> I had my camera off because I thought my imitation of life background might be a bit distracting. <laughs> um, but um, thank you, Hannah. Amazing as always. I was just, I'm, I try to form it as a question, but I was just thinking back to your flashpoints and thinking about the Olympics, which yeah. you didn't mention, which, and I know you said there are plenty of things you couldn't have mentioned, but they seem to have, they, because of its timing, right? 2012 and the law, and then of and it's international tension brought to lovely dancing nurses and beds and moving beds and things. Um, and then this, and this kind of historical full, well, maybe not full circle, but to clap for NHS, right? In time of pandemic. Um, and of course, in this time where continually the NHS is being sold off and, um, I, and I and it the clap for the NHS is interesting because I think there was some done some some of that done in like cities like New York as well, um, so um, that it's but the NHS and the Olympics was this moment where the NHS was on this it had this international platform and you know the amount of social media that we did saying I love the NHS and all that and I just. I don't know if, again, I can't seem to formulate it as a question, but it seems like a particularly time in terms of historical mapping of the, um, what's happening with NHS in the last, you know, more than a decade or so. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right, of course, that um, uh, as in the context of everything that happened in 2012, I should have acknowledged the Olympic opening ceremony. Um, uh, I, I did have a slide of it, but I, I, I took it out so that I wouldn't have to write more to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, but of course, it is the biggest and most obvious flashpoint that happened around the Health and Social Care um, Act uh, flashpoint that I uh, didn't talk about. But um, sorry, I, I, I kind of lost what your question was uh, in between full circle yeah. and mapping. I think there's just that struck me, and maybe, maybe, maybe this is just my lack of 
General Knowles, but it seems to me a kind of parallel between the NHS moment on, in the Olympics and the clap for the NHS and this kind of public celebration of the NHS and NHS workers. Um, that's about public participation that it's not and every um, that of course mediatized but it's not like these other kinds of media representations whether documentaries or fiction or whatever oh I see it's the public participation element I guess I'm kind of thinking of parallels yeah, yeah. and uh, one thing about the fact that it was participatory I found really interesting um, was the people's policing of each other's behavior about it and then the way that policing like real world policing of each other's behavior about it then got mediatized on social media whether in the form of of parody uh, or in more uh sincere uh forms and i don't know what that says to me about the extent to which people think like um that uh performative gestures can or will translate yeah. into change or whether they even think they should uh taking it back i guess to jilly's original question yeah yeah i guess that's the thing that gets me the performative nature of these things that we got kind of all excited about and then they mm. inevitably disappoint us as you quite rightly um explain so anyway that's it thank you thanks shell um brett has asked me a really good question in the chat that i probably can't answer because he's the expert on genre um but uh it that is a really important thing that I haven't thought about enough, which is like formal conventions and uh, specificities of uh, genre. Um, uh, uh, and, and so the answer is I probably haven't thought about it enough, but, um, but one thing I really am interested to think about more is comedy, especially in so far as um, uh, comedy works to critique some of the uh, political decisions that have brought these flashpoints about. And so for that reason, prob probably for me, the most important example uh, of a representation of nurses that I didn't include in the presentation uh, was Getting On, which was such an obvious searing critique of the neoliberalization of the NHS and the deleterious effects of the Health and Social Care Act, especially because there was kind of a gap between uh, the second series and the third series during which time the act was implemented. And it was just really interesting to see how they uh, accommodated that into the resident discourse of the, of the sitcom format. Um, but, but that's still not answering Brett's question about genre, which I can't because it's his thing. Um. Thank you, thank you for that answer, um, Hannah. I don't know if there are any other hands raised or any more um, um, comments in the chat box. I think I've seen that Charlie has, has posted the link to the uh, to the exhibition at Wolverhampton um, and you can access this through Q, QR oh, code. Th thank you, Charlie, that's great news. Oh yeah, I see the link, I see it. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, yes, and well, um, so I guess, well, I, I was thinking about this the the uh, the, uh, the clap for clap for NHS phenomenon and that you were talking about, um, um, and again wondering about the kind of the specificity of how that played out in the in the um, British context because, like Shelley said, it obviously did have sort of counterparts in other parts of the world. Um, but I think it, it was specifically like clap for, for NHS and maybe in other countries it was more clap for carers or a more general sense of kind of key workers, whereas in Britain that was sort of for the NHS specifically and it was so weird to kind of wasn't it to like go around and see posters up in in what in quite often in what I knew were like Tory voting households of you know we love the NHS you know this kind of uh, this new this newfound love for the NHS and I guess I just wonder what you think about the uh, this kind of when when people say that or when there's the, the dominant ways in which this love for the nhs is proclaimed what what do you think is sort of behind that that love is it is it a love like should we be hopeful because it is is it a love for kind of socialized healthcare and a socialized model of care well obviously not but we wouldn't be where we are um because i mean i wish i knew the answer uh jilly and and i wish that i wish that people would show their their love at the ballot box rather than in their front windows 
right yes yeah yeah uh, yeah and i liked i liked there was some that me i saw on twitter which was like the tory voters um would do well to stay at home on voting day and that's the you know you know stay at home save lives as mm. in don't vote conservative um but um so just a couple more comments there so, so uh, people saying uh, so brett saying thank you for the answer and looking forward to hearing more especially about getting on i hope we can chat about it sometime brett sorry that my answer was lame <laughs> um i wonder like since since uh since um you know you, you talked about the the inspiration for uh for your work being uh being partly because of your mum's your mum's uh uh work as, as a nurse i guess maybe you could tell us something a bit more about kind of you know what has driven this interest and and how you came to it has it always been something that you've been interested in in an academic sense um so maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that kind of uh, how you've come to this topic and yeah well I haven't always been interested in it in an academic sense but I have always been interested in it just because like just because it's coloured my life uh, uh, so much um, but I, I think that the fact that she was a um, single mother NHS worker in Thatcher's Britain when I was growing up just shaped a lot about the way that I viewed the relationship between society and political culture and um, that her her life as an NHS nurse, her working life as an NHS nurse was the lens through which I saw that when I was a child. Um, so yeah, and then, then eventually it did just start to come through uh, in my academic interest in it. I, I'd probably say that it was, it was everything that happened during the, um, during the coalition government. Everything that happened to the NHS during the coalition government was when I turned the corner towards having an academic interest in it, um, especially the first time I saw getting on and I just saw how boldly it was dealing um, uh, with the imminent implementation of the CARE Act. And, and, even, and even before that piece of legislation, how boldly it was dealing with the deleterious effects of marketization um, on the experience of working in hospitals and being a patient in hospitals just um, uh, in its early episode and just as that um, happened gradually over time to the point where uh, by the time that series um, started uh, um, neoliberal practices were just completely entrenched in how hospitals ran and the more the more conscious I became of that and the more I learned about neoliberalism the better getting on got as it went through its broadcast run uh, the more obsessed I became with it from an academic point of view. Thank you yes that, that's really interesting thank you and I, sorry, I can just see that uh, there's a um, um, Kevin I think would like to ask a question but can't find the raise your hand command so please. Hi, Hi Kevin. Hi, uh, sorry I, <laughs> I'm new to this platform. I've been using other digital platforms and I couldn't find the button and I, I wanted to speak rather than to try to type out my question. Thank you Hannah for a fascinating and a fabulous talk. I really enjoyed that. What I'm wondering is um, uh, one of the familiar tropes it seems to me from dramatic representations of hospitals and nursing and particularly in the U.S. context I think of shows like ER, and I think of Hollywood films like Coma, say, uh, which was remade recently. Um, and it seems like what, um, you know, one of the tropes is about the kind of devaluation of nurses as, a by, uh, as it's expressed partly through their placement within medical hierarchies. And there's kind of struggles for respect from doctors. And that this becomes a way of opening on to questions about the wider valuation of nurses it seems to me socially do you find it have you found any of this in any of the kind of representations that you've explored well as you were explaining that one of the th first places i went back to in my mind was the sitcom getting on again in which uh, in which doctors are made to appear ridiculous um and that 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 is a kind of uh, uh a discourse that colors a lot of um uh, the depictions of of hierarchies in in medical contexts in in UK examples in 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 particular and in comedies there are often jokes made about nurses knowing as much as the doctors and um, uh, and, and and even out, outside of that I I'm also thinking now about the 
uh, the Jodie Whittaker series, Trust Me, in which she uses the knowledge that she's gained from a career in nursing to uh, to pose as a doctor success and she does this successfully for uh, a period of time um i've lost the thread of what your question was kevin i'm sorry I mean, um, no but i mean it does seem like this because this is a, again a recurring trope is that it is often turns out that nurses you know do more of the work around the hospital than doctors do and this is often a kind of theme that seems to play out in some of these shows and mm. I'm just wondering if, yeah, if you, the extent to which you found that and the extent to which you feel that that opens, that's had any impact in terms of kind of wider, so those kinds of depictions, if whether they're prevalent in UK rep, uh, media to the extent that they are in the top of my head anyway, in some US depictions and whether you think that that has any kind of impact on these wider debates around the valuation and de undervaluation. Of mm. I, actually, I actually think they do because, um... Uh, uh, one thing I really remember from, again, from reading about the history of nursing that I just did as background uh, uh, reading uh, for the research is uh, uh, a lot of struggles that have taken place uh, over the years to have nursing seen as a profession uh, and, um, and, and debates about whether it was good or bad that nursing was professionalized and that nurses should be encouraged to get bachelor's degrees. And it, yeah, it was just really interesting seeing those debates play out in the 80s at a time um, uh, uh, when, when the hierarchization across roles and between professions was very stark, um, and within the the roles was also uh, very stark to the extent that um, uh, uh, f uh, following rules and orders and adhering to the hierarchy was more important in a nurse's training than answering questions. Uh, or, or so, uh, I'm sorry, then asking questions and learning, uh, uh, learning the reason why they were doing something uh, 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 as opposed to just following an order. And um, yeah, so, so I have come across it, but I, um, yeah, I, I don't know the extent to which it influences the wider debates, but my sense is that it is important. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. I can see there's a couple more um, points and questions in the chat box. And uh, um, Diane said, have you kept an eye on Ken Loach's film work on the importance of the NHS and, he, uh, and how he looks at nursing specifically? Can you do it? No. Thanks, Diane, for the tip. I will look it up. If you bring me the bag, I can have a look for you. OK. Oh. Um, so, um, and, and then also another suggestion or question about a particular text, which is, um, Charlie says, have you seen the brief comedy series Quacks focusing on Victorian medicine and surgery? Um, because there's a focus on the only female main character mm. wanting to go to medicine and the challenges against her by her surgeon husband. Yeah, I heard of it, but I haven't seen that yet. It sounds like one I, 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 I need to watch. Thanks, Charlie. And yeah, the historical context. Yeah, no, I'm I'm all about the the period representations. Hence, my obsession with call the midwife. <laughs> um, and I guess that sort of makes me wonder, you know, how, you know, how is is it very very difficult mapping these representations across media? I mean, are they proliferating? Are there, you know, how is it very is it difficult to keep a handle on how many mediations of nursing we're seeing? And I guess particularly. With with social media now as well, I'm thinking it was thinking of um, you know nurses um posting like TikTok dances um and you know so this just I guess the as with everything, nursing is becoming sort of hyper mediated and there are just so many different yeah representations. So I guess is that a challenge? It's a huge challenge um uh, and it is really difficult and that is that's probably the main reason why I haven't managed to get this off the ground as a research project because I can't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that like the level of data gathering it would require probably needs a research team and I don't have one. And the only way to have one is to get money and I haven't. <laughs> but is this something that you would like sort of like to see as a sort of much bigger sort of yeah. project? Yeah, yeah. So I, I had at one point envisaged trying to mobilize it into a into a major research project, but I just haven't been able to but maybe one day yeah that would be wonderful 
Um, do you see there's a there's a comment from Shelley as well about yes. I, I know she loves it. She loves. <laughs> oh, Sabrina has a question too. Please feel free, Sabrina, go for it. Yes, hi, sorry. I was trying to find the hand function right. Yeah, never mind. Um I was wondering, Hannah, does your does your research focus only on like um NHS um kind of stories or do you also look at um, contemporary representation of nurses but addressing like a period that would be earlier mm. because it seems that, that like in, in a lot of contemporary drama and especially kind of um, with the rise of um, with like austerity measures there's kind of a renewed interest in first and second world war stories and mm. often you'll have like you know, powerful, interesting female characters that um, then become nurses as a as a kind of way to get into or to gain, kind of, you know, get into the narrative arc, but also, um, uh, you know, to, uh, yes, kind of like their personal and professional development. So I'm thinking of like Downton Abbey, where there's one of the sisters that's become the nurse and then in Outlander as well, like the whole fact that the character was a nurse during the World War allows her to then do a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just kind of like thinking of all those various second and first World War nurse narratives that then, um, you know, are not about, they're not TV shows specifically about nurses, but that's a prominent trait tra yeah. of those characters. Although there have been some, uh, like um, I think not long after um, Call the Midwife started in the um, uh, uh, early part of the last decade, uh, there was a, a World War I drama about nurses called The Crimson Field um, with, um, oh, I forget her name now, Thingy Chaplin playing the, the central character who, yeah, um, uh, uh, is part of a, yeah, a team of nurses in a kind of field hospital at the front uh, during the First World War. So, um, so I think that um, that is a really uh, uh, fruitful area of inquiry as well. But, but in answer to your original question, yeah, I haven't thought about it that much because I have mostly been uh, focused on how it all intersects with the context of the uh, NHS. Um, but I think the points you raise about how contextually important and interesting this representational trend is um, uh, are, uh, are valid. And that's not something I thought about before. So I think I definitely will now. Thank you, Sabrina. No, but I was just thinking what I was trying to say is that um, those those depictions often focus on individual characters who are nurses in the context of an ensemble. And, and therefore, there's kind of, there are more there's a tension between the neoliberal kind of a, a way that that they address, you know, using period drama to reactivate neoliberal narrative focused on the individual, whereas Call the Midwife is quite a striking different example in contrast that is an ensemble character and much more kind of socialist uh, mindset that's what sorry I was trying to yeah yeah, yeah. And that's that's a really interesting uh, uh, difference I must admit I actually I actually don't even really know the, the shows that you're talking about I've never seen Outlander and I didn't know it had a nurse character in it but um, now now I need to see it <laughs> um Somebody else is struggling with the with the with the raise hand function. It must be sort of hard to find. Um, um, a Bethan, would you like to um, ask your question? Yeah, thank you. So I'm not turning my um, video on. I'm in my pajamas. I'm not really fit for um, public viewing. Um, I was just thinking about how often when we talk about the NHS, there's this really sort of um, possessive language in a way you know it's always RA NHS um, and there's kind of discussion for that but simultaneously there's a real um, I was thinking about both the lack of ownership of nurses they kind of get pushed away mm -hmm. and then also when where but when working with nurses there's also this kind of sense of it seems from friends who are nurses anyway um, a sense of entitlement to them as well you know nurses are often kind of quite bullied or expected as that they're not doing their job properly or um, as though they're kind of I don't know, symbolic some way of an NHS that's failing or not quite caring enough or doing something that's there. Yeah. Apologies is turning into more of a comment than a question um, but I was just wondering if you'd kind of thought about that kind of constant tension about the need to kind of pull nurses close and see them as something really um, highly important and then also to um, devalue them and how that kind of 
perceptions and a kind of wider rhetoric about the NHS. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that I would absolutely have wanted to talk more about if I'd had uh, more time in the talk and if I hadn't wasted so much uh, of my time on more boring bits. But um, uh, uh, so just thinking about it in relation to my flashpoints that I talked about in in uh, the, the talk, the aftermath of the Staffordshire uh, scandal really um, uh, draws a, a, a line under what you're uh talking about there because uh it was just so interesting to see different ways in which uh some media fictions cleaved possessively uh to um nurses in the way that you described and how elsewhere in the media especially in um uh the um tabloid news media um uh there were they were like at the center of this like culture of finger pointing and blame for the things that had gone wrong at structural levels um uh to produce this crisis of care in this one uh primary care trust and it, it was really interesting to me that even though the the findings of the report um uh laid the blame at the door of management failings and structural uh problems so much of the media discourse made it about a failure of care on the part of individual nurses um so yeah that's a to me that's a really really interesting uh uh, uh issue and a really interesting uh double bind that uh, i need to get to grips with more um that's just made me think about the um uh how you know the a similar move you see with uh with with care workers so when you get scandals in care in care homes um invariably the blame gets apportioned to to individual care workers um, we've seen this just recently um uh in the the government's blaming of individual care workers for not wearing ppe and following their guidelines Right. Yeah. Yes. And that's the that's the reason that, yeah, that the that care homes have become these. Yeah. Where, where coronavirus has, has has become so prevalent. Yeah, that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess I guess then it, what what do you see as kind of like it, so is I guess the, the focus on nurses is so interesting, but I guess it also plays into a much a, a wider context where we see similar things potentially with representations of, of teachers. Um, other uh, is this potentially something which is indicative of sort of feminized public sector work more, more broadly? Um, it's a really good question. It's a good, really good question. My critical instinct is to say yes, but I've got no grounds for it. <laughs> um, and, and, and obviously I can't help thinking about the parallels to be drawn um, between uh, uh, the parallels to be drawn uh, with the university sector as well, because we all work and or study in it. And, um, and, and taking it back to the example of uh, getting on, which as I mentioned before, views the neoliberalization of the NHS through the eyes uh, principally of um, a group of uh, nurses uh um my uh the the sound of the the ter the term patient experience was ringing in my ears when i was re-watching it uh uh recently and it's yeah it's so striking to see the same language of neoliberalism being used to deleterious effect in one public sector context to another or what used to be a public sector context and um um yeah 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 absolutely I, yeah absolutely um i'm wondering if there are any more um questions in the chat box or if if, if you can't raise your hand then feel free to just kind of uh just uh, to share your your mic um but i guess since we're coming um towards Oh, oh, and one's just popped up now, actually. Um, so uh, can you see that, Hannah, uh, from, from Diane? Um, maybe I can just read that out as well for, for others. So with you mentioning the move to turn nursing into a degree qualification as opposed to what was seen as an earlier, more hands-on training, this seems to have married together in public discourse with the idea of the NHS becoming more alienated from the public rather than seeing it as a consequence of politics yeah. um, and economics of neoliberalism. Um, yes, so 
Yeah, I completely agree with everything that uh, Diane said there, and she just put it really, really beautifully. Mm -hmm. um, uh, while, while I'm here, I'd just like to say that it's really, really lovely that Diane is here and that Beth is here and that Brett is here. They were all fabulous contributors to um, the special issue um, on medical television that I co-edited with um, Julia Hallam some years ago. And I'm, I'm really touched and delighted that they all came today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's wonderful. I'm touched and delighted that you all came today. But <laughs> maybe somebody could post a link to that in the in the chat box so that so that people are able to um, to to link to that work. That would be really really great. Um, I guess um, in our media and gender meetings, we always try to end with some kind of glimmer of hope um, at the end. And so I just wonder where you see the kind of grounds for hope for uh, in in. In, in your research um, or, you know, in such a bleak and sort of uh, despair inducing time, what, what where might we find kind of grounds for hope and sort of potential mobilization? Well, maybe I shouldn't be so cynical about people's front windows and maybe people's front windows is ground for hope, grounds for hope. And if people love, value and appreciate what the NHS uh, 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 allows us uh, to, have as much as they say they do then maybe their front windows are something to be celebrated rather than just make snarky comments about <laughs> um yes yeah absolutely well i i kind of share your 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 pessimism and cynicism but 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 but, but they, maybe there is some kind of glimmer of hope in those posters and those 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 clap clappings for nhs and so on I do genuinely hope so, despite my cynicism. <laughs> well, I'd just like to thank uh, Hannah again so much for such a wonderful and thought provoking talk. And I'm sure everybody else is really excited to see uh, to see this uh, research develop. And um, yeah, I can't wait to uh, to see where it goes. And and, you know, it, it's just underscored for me what it, it's such an important area it is and how much, uh, I, you know, and we're so lucky to have such a wonderful researcher uh, um, exploring this area. Um, and thank you for sharing your work with us. Well, it's my pleasure. I hope one day I'll get to mobilize the project um, properly. I really hope so. And, and uh, Beth did post the link to the issue in the chat if anyone's interested. Uh -huh, wonderful, yeah, there we go. Yeah, definitely check that out. Um, yeah, and maybe you can come back and share your research with us when uh, a bit further down the line, and we'd love to hear uh, um, uh, where you've gone with it. Um, but um, I'd also just like to thank everybody else for coming. Um, it's been a really, really wonderful, um, inspiring event, and thank you for all your contributions. Um, and we hope to see you uh, at the fu at future events. Uh, we've got a few more coming up, so please do check those out um, and get in touch if you'd like to come along to any of them. Everybody's really welcome to come to those. Um, but thank you, Hannah, for, for brightening up our weeks with such a wonderful talk and hope to see everybody really soon. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. I will just stop the live stream. I just noticed part way through that that I'm drinking out of a